go. Hello, Good Professor Spooner. Hi, how are you? This is our last meeting of a calendar year. What? Uh, so it's a good time to um, uh, look back and see to what extent globalization has progressed in the course of the last 12 months. Uh, I, know, I don't know how I much, I don't know necessarily how much has progressed, but there certainly has been a lot of reaction to it. <laughs> well, what I was going to say is that I think a lot of people would uh, say that um, there's uh, been a lot of resistance to globalization in the last 12 months. Yes. Um, or resistance to various things that are going on that were probably caused by globalization. Um, and uh, my response to that is that it's an awareness of globalization that uh, is leading to the response. And the awareness of globalization is increasing. And, and I think the most important thing about globalization is the awareness. Uh, now, that's uh, certainly not the way economists see globalization. It's not the way political scientists see globalization, or most other social scientists, I think. Uh, but they want to see actual practical things like uh, um, a trade increase in international trade or increase in political in the size of political units. Um, but I think that it's the awareness of the whole world uh, as it grows that is the most important factor in producing the other things. I, I think you could you could be right because even the uh... Uh, the most uh, nativist reactors, uh, so to speak, in, in, for example, the Brexit vote or the, uh, the, the vote for Trump, even those people are, are much more aware of globalization than they might have been two or three or four years ago. They, they may not be aware of it in as positive a manner as we discuss it, but they have a, a perception of it rightly or wrongly uh, that's very subjective to them, but they clearly are aware of it. Yeah, uh, I think that it's it's uh, it, it's very plain in everything that happens. Actually, um, I think that uh, um, everybody. I mean, what Erdogan is doing, he's thinking of Turkey in a larger context. Uh, what uh, Putin is doing, he's worrying not about not just about the bipolar situation that. He was uh, trained in mm -hmm. uh, before 1991, but Russia's place in the modern world. Mm -hmm. um, uh, um, Trump seems to be very much uh, concerned with America in relation to everything else. You know, just exactly what he's going to do with it, we don't really know yet. But but uh, he's been talking, making contact with a quite a large variety of different. Um, national leaders. That, um, that, that's interesting that uh, that Putin has been able to move away from the uh, the one-on-one -on -one kind of perception that he has been trained in to uh, thinking about Russia's place in this new world and wanting to get this country of only 150 million people with a stagnant economy that, as Obama appropriately said, doesn't produce anything that anyone wants to buy wants to put this country into the forefront of a, of a global player. I mean, it, it practically has like one-eighth of the population of China. Yeah. Um, so I, I've been sort of thinking about the, the, the end of the year in this way and wondering what parts of the world seem to be more uh, included in everybody's awareness and what parts of the world seem to be behind and not so included in everybody's awareness. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me that uh, uh, South America gets left out. They do. And, um, and I, I think that that has a long history and uh, I found it very interesting, for example, during the period that um, British Airways are flying the Concorde, that they chose to make uh, South America one of the routes 
because that really puts South America on the map in a way that uh, rarely happens. You're right. It used, and, to go to, it used to go to Rio, didn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Now, Rio is probably, if, 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 if anybody's asked to name a city in South America, Rio is probably the first one they would think of. Um, but uh, it's certainly not the only big city there, no. either in Brazil or in uh, the, the continent altogether. Um, but it's, it is, um, I find it surprising that um, um, the, somehow South America gets left out, uh, more so than South, South Africa, for example, or, mm -hmm. or Australia. I, I've often wondered why, uh, when I was, used to be traveling much more than I do now, uh, why there wasn't much more uh, interaction, uh, many more flights from Australia to South Africa to South America, instead of if you wanted to go from one of those places to the other, you had to come up to the northern hemisphere and then go back down again. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, in fact, there were some, some long distance flights uh, from between two of those points did, were started. I don't know whether they're still functioning or not. You know, that's an interesting observation. I, I had an uh, opportunity to speak with a, a Portuguese American uh, the other day, a professional person uh, who uh, left Portugal at the age of 12 and is now thoroughly Americanized. He's an accountant here. And uh, his mother is still back in uh, the Lisbon suburbs, uh, as are many of his relatives. He goes back uh, for about three weeks every year. And I, I happen to think to ask him how uh, Brazil is perceived in the day-to-day the -day consciousness of Portugal. I mean, is it something that they're aware of and that do they, do they think about Brazil? And he was most emphatic. He said, oh, absolutely. I mean, Brazil is, is very much in the consciousness of Portuguese people, of all Portuguese people. There's a certain pride associated with it. They're aware that there's this gigantic country some 4,000 miles away that speaks Portuguese, uh, that has a, a history of uh, the, the common history in many ways. And air flights are, are numerous back and forth between Lisbon and Brasilia and Rio and Sao Paulo. And uh, I, was, uh, I was happy to hear this, um, that, that I, I had been aware of the, the air bridge between Brazil and Portugal, but I, I never quite knew whether Brazil was prominent in uh, the Portuguese consciousness, if you will. Yeah. Now, it's particularly interesting, the case of Portugal, because Portugal was um, uh, a, a late formation in, on the European political scene, um, and, and yet the first big um, uh, colonizer. Yeah. And, uh, and, and yet in modern Europe, it tends to be the country that people think of last. Right, um, right. Well, it's, it's the most separate, if you will, in many ways. It's certainly the, the closest one to, to North America and, and to, the, to the Western Hemisphere. But uh, yeah. it, uh, do you, when you were talking about South America being ignored, so to speak, is it, is it South America being ignored in the globalization Conscious, consciousness context, because certainly people in South America are quite aware of globalization. Yes, but I think that, that people in the rest of the world, when they're thinking, that their, their level of awareness as it rises uh, takes in what's going on in Europe, Asia, um, Australia, and Africa even, mm -hmm. especially South Africa. But not South America. Yeah, you're right. So um, I'm sure people in South America are very much aware of the rest of the world um, so because they need it. Mm -hmm. um, though uh, I'm afraid it's one part of the world that I've seen uh, very little of, so I can't really speak from experience. Now, I can't let this broadcast go on without asking about the news from Syria. <laughs> what is what is your view as to what was uh, last night? Well, I mean, it's a that Syria is a it's is an awful situation, but but if you can look at it uh, from a distance, it's a very interesting situation because it's uh, it's crucial to the whole Middle East. It it's it was defined in its current terms. Um, 
more well uh, redefined in its current terms by the British and the French, mm -hmm. uh, not almost a century ago. But it's had a, a an identity of its own much longer than Iraq has really. Um, and but but it's it never been a nation. Uh, as it's now supposed to be because it, uh, the idea of nation-state was imposed upon it by uh, the British and the French. Right. Um, and, and it's full of all these minorities and one minority has been controlling it for most of the 20th century, uh, or at least the second half of the 20th century in particular. The Alawites. And, and now... Hmm? The Alawites. Yeah, the Alawites. And which is a Shia group, but a, a particular type of Shia group, which is very different from the ones in Lebanon and from the established religion in Iran, or the ones in Iraq. Uh, nevertheless, they accept them as Shia and think that they, they very much want to preserve this island of island community of Shias in there, and especially uh, they don't want it to be submerged into a Sunni state. Uh, because they feel that that would be um, detrimental to the um, basic um, lives of the Shia community. I don't know what proportion of the whole uh, population of Syria they are, um, but the the, uh, the 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 it before uh, the idea of nation state was imposed on the Middle East in the early 20th century. Um, the Islamic world was very diverse yes. and, and got along very well with its diversity. And yes, there were problems between Sunni and Shia every now and then, but nothing like the problems we have now. But it's the, the idea of uh, a state being a nation that has uh, given rise to this sense that everybody has to be the same within the state. And, and so the Sunnis in most cases are in the majority, so everybody else should have to be Sunni. Um, and this is a big test of that. Well, that, so, th th that's why I thought that the, uh, the signatories to the peace agreement were, were sort of initially a little bit of an eclectic group, but uh, it's almost as if they, they recognize, they being Putin and the Turks, I suppose, I mean, recognize that they were going to execute an agreement with certain groups and not with the country as a whole. Of course, they executed the agreement with the president of Syria. I understand that. But the, the Sunni extremists have been deliberately left out. Al-Qaeda has been deliberately left out. The Islamic State has been deliberately left out. They're going to continue to prosecute the military action against them. <clears throat> and it's, it's almost a recognition that we're going to deal with the working parts rather than the fiction of the nation as a whole. Well, the the the, um, the best case for supporting Assad is that he's the only person that anybody knows of who might um, uh, um, maintain a diverse state and not uh, promote turn it into a Sunni state. Mm -hmm. uh, and even though. Uh, it's difficult to back him, but then it's difficult to back a lot of other people in the Middle East. So yeah. uh, it's, a, it's a difficult problem. And of course, um, what I've said on and off for a long time is that um, we can't impose solutions on the Middle East. Um, and most of the problems there now are due to the fact that we've imposed solutions in the past. Um, and, and we've got to somehow allow them to work things out for themselves. But um, that's also very difficult, um, and uh, it, because if, if, if one Western country says, okay, we're going to let them work it out for themselves, then another Western country will interfere and try to impose their solution. Uh, it, it has to be a, a, a some sort of UN agreement uh, that everybody participates in in the Security Council to let them work it out for themselves and to work with them as they work it out for themselves. But that is very difficult to imagine. And it's going to be, that's going to be increasingly more difficult after Trump is sworn in. <laughs> Give it. So uh, can we be optimistic about 2017? Um, uh, I, I, I'm not. 
<laughs> well, I'm an optimist, and uh, uh, I think that uh, it's amazing what uh, Trump said in the campaign, but it's also very interesting how he's revised a lot of what he said in the campaign um, in the last uh, few weeks. Um, and uh, the American system is such that the president often can't do what he wants to do anyway, and the, the biggest problems often come from the other parts of the executive, well, not the executive, the, the, what the executive has to deal with in order to get anything done. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, I think this is going to be an interesting test of oh, yeah, America sure. finding its place in the in the world as it continues to globalize in 2017. Well, we shall be watching eagerly. So, <laughs> well, best uh, wishes for a happy new year, Professor Schooner. And the same to you. Thank you very much.